I'm Mark Landy, this is Will Evans, and we're gonna go, I'm from Johnson & Johnson. Will is from PraxisFlow. Will is Chief Design Officer in Residence at um, NYU CERN, also one of the bright minds at Praxis. And um, been knowing each other for about what, three years now? Yeah, about that. Yeah, so we're gonna go through a journey uh, around how we've integrated DevOps and enterprise architecture. But first, a little bit about myself. I'll ask Will to. Yeah, so let's see. Um, I first met Mark about three years ago, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we kind of embedded some of these ideas inside of the talk itself. Um, but uh, <clears throat> when I first met him, he had some very interesting challenges. He had just uh, previously been the chief technology officer at a company called Medco. He had mm -hmm. moved over to Johnson & Johnson, and it's kind of like, um, you know, you've been sailing a 34-foot boat for quite a while. You've become relatively good. And in fact, you're a damn good skipper. And all of a sudden, somebody mm -hmm. gives you um, not just the keys to the enterprise aircraft carrier, but an entire fleet. And so the, the, the scale of challenges is very unique. Um, but uh, Mark also was actually overseeing the trans agile transformation at a company called GSI Commerce, um, which he yep. had done. But his background is, you know, he's an electrical engineer. He's, he's, he likes to get in there and actually observe and, and figure out how things work. Um, and so this has been a, a great, and it, and it really yes. matched a lot of the practice flow ideas around uh, experimentation and the scientific method. And Mark already had that, and I think all I've been doing over the last couple of years is, is providing some ideas once in a while. Oh, we want to make sure that you tweet the crap out of this. Yes. So... <laughs> Hashtag DOES16, um, these are our Twitter handles. Um, and before we get into the real meat of things, um, I think Gene Kim is in the back of the room. Gene, are you there? So there the only reason I say this is I want, to, I want a huge round of applause for the community, the empathy, the respect that he has been um, gathering together over the last three or four years. So a huge round of respect for Gene. Yep. And one more thing I want you to do. If you could whip out your uh, smartphone, first, set it to vibrate. Second, <laughs> turn on your camera, get close to the people around you, take a selfie, post it on Twitter with the hashtag DOES16, hashtag DevOps culture. That way, everybody knows what's going on here. That would be awesome. I'll give you one minute. It's time boxed. It's a constraint. <laughs> Yep. All right, so while we're doing that, a little bit about Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and I'm sure everybody understands or has heard of what Johnson & Johnson is. We do a lot of IT work, and it may not have been known. And our company traditionally had kept IT in the back office. That's the convention where it was. Lots of heavy manufacturing and R&D. The science was really in the labs with the lab coats because we do things like actually cure major diseases, which for me is a pleasure because I gotta say, in my, all my years I've been working in healthcare, it's usually been in the access or insurance markets. Now I'm actually in the delivery. And when you're in IT and you get a request from a scientist who says, I need to upgrade a, a cluster, and you start to ask why, and by the way, why do you have your own cluster? Well, I, so I could do these algorithms and and what's, what are you working on? Oh, uh, immuno-oncology. So, okay, you're curing cancer. Got it. The, you know, where's, how do you monetize that stuff, right? So we're going to go through what is going to be an interesting journey on emergence and weaving DevOps and architecture together. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things, and, and, and this kind of sets the context for the kind of, you know, the previous slide tells you a little bit about the size and scale, you know, 500 terabytes of data, 450 apps released um, every single year. The other interesting thing, and Johnson & Johnson has grown both organically, but also through acquisition. So inorganically, yep. one of the key things to remember is when you have at any given point about 14 acquisitions or divestitures that are currently in flight, talk about limiting your um, A and D, right? That creates a whole lot of negative behaviors. It means that we have things like a cycle time for an acquisition until we realize business value of like four years. Yep. Um, so there, there are also a lot of different kinds of pressures that are happening. There are industry pressures that are happening. There are external market forces that are, that are 
putting a great deal of pressure on how you actually deliver value. But the other thing is just the major disruptions that have happened just over the last 15 to 20 years as more and more IT stuff that people had been investing in, right, mm -hmm. um, which became CapEx, which we needed to depreciate over a significant portion of time, that actually becomes baggage that slows you down. And right. all these new startups, right, they don't have all that baggage. They're able nope. to spin up instances immediately on AWS and really start to innovate um, what we would call at the fuzzy front end of product innovation. Right, and so with all of these disruptions that are occurring in the healthcare ecosystem, certainly the move to better access, the move to better outcomes, it all speaks to data. Uh, it also speaks to we really don't all know what it means yet, so we have to be able to change quickly and pivot. And you combine that with our own, um, with our company's natural tendency to, at this stage in its life, over 128 some odd years old, um, we grow through acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you plan or whatever you think you can put, build in a, and the conversation before is all about process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the time you think you've gotten something process modeled and documented and pushed out, in three years, another 20 or 30% of the company will be different. Mm -hmm. And you really have to look at what we do at J&J as serving a small market of business needs that really is an amalgam of the actual market and small to mid-sized healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. way we treat it. So we're gonna cover more fancy terms, ephemeralization, which really is at the centerpiece of how we've put together enterprise architecture and DevOps. Ephemeralization, everything from virtual or software defined all the way up to rapid experiments that are safe to fail, not fail safe. This mindset, this thinking, which actually goes back many, many years before virtualization, literally means doing more with less to the point where you can do infinite work with nothing. But that's a that's kind of like calculus. It's almost like L'Hospital's well, rule. <laughs> right. One of the interesting, and this was a thought experiment that Mark introduced me to before we even began the journey, before we started to think about how would we design the federated enterprise architecture. Right. Um, and when we were thinking about this ephemeralization, and, and originally it came from, uh, the notion came from Buckminster Fuller. And what he was doing was really critiquing this guy, uh, an economist named Tom, Thomas Malthus, who said, you know, yeah. um, we have a finite number of resources. Um, those resources are be being depleted every year, but our, our population growth continues to uh, grow and grow and grow. Um, and Buckminster Fuller's reply to that was actually that we're learning how to do significantly more with less. And this is kind of right. informed by Moore's law, which is, you know, as computing power uh, doubles every 18 months, it requires less and less materials, less and less raw resources to be able to get better business outcomes or more business outcomes. Um, and, and these things kind of inform the way we thought. But the other thing is, is this leads immediately into, can we plan upfront a major transformation when at the end of the day, Johnson & Johnson is really 260 operating companies within three yeah. sectors where each one has some degree of autonomy. Um, many of the, of the local opco CIOs or, or heads of engineering have their own mm -hmm. P&L, which means yep. they can make a lot of decisions. And sometimes we can't necessarily from the top down, from the executive committee down, dictate how everybody does their work. Exactly. We can't dictate it, and it never really made sense back in the days when we thought we got away with it as an IT industry. It really, it really is about emergence. I mean, if you've ever done major IT project work with real project plans, the planning is awesome. The planning is great. When you actually try and chunk through the program, and by, you know, gosh darn it, you're going to stick to these milestones, you got it done by the relationships and the people that you knew, and you crashed at the end. So we've all learned, hey, let's not just do that again. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. DevOps and Agile and all of those things think about the flow and value creation, which is a left to right, not a top down uh, controlling. So informing us for how I'm going to do architecture and why architecture? Well, I was hired principally because friends of mine ended up leading parts of IT and that's how it works in our industry. But I was hired to create and really create a version of enterprise architecture that drove value. Now, if I just got some TOGAF certifications and had people trained and installed a, you know, a, an inventory tool, I could just say, done, but why, right? So why do we have enterprise architecture? And to me, it was a huge opportunity to weave the DevOps spirits of flow, right, value creation, but at the high order economic level. So not just getting work done faster, 
but why are we doing this work as opposed to other work? Mm -hmm. And what economic value does it generate for our company? And we were getting and, and seeking and getting permission to ask for relaxed constraints at the business level. And conveniently, our leadership was looking for that at the time. So it started to really emerge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, emergence uh, combined with fancy words like ephemeralization really just means establish the constraints, situation, context, and coaching and care and feeding so that an outcome, ideally a beneficial outcome, uh, will grow. Um, with 260 some odd operating companies distributed around the globe, changing all the time, uh, you really have to go with emergence. And the model I like to use if you had your smartphone is, when you bought that, did you get requirement docs and a change management program and did you, no, you liked it so you got it, right? So in that regard, what can we do in J&J in IT to create awesome value for our business partners? And that had to be the rule. Now to do that, that also meant that we had to think about the constraints and when we can get into shaping our demand. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and this is really important, and it kind of leads to the, to the very next slide, is allowing for the conditions where emergence can happen, where people can run constant experimentation, they still need to understand what is the why, right? And, and yeah. we're kind of explicitly referencing Simon Sinek here. Um, what is the purpose? And the nice thing is J&J um, &J actually has this. Um, and one of the things, um, Mark will describe what the credo does and where it came from, and then I'll give kind of a philosophical spin on it. Yeah, so our, the, the text you see here, and it, you can please go to our website and find our credo. Um, I read it when I joined the company. Um, we use it as an internal rubric for decision making. For, it's, it's used at the highest level of business ethics. Um, it is in four paragraphs. It was written by General Robert Johnson 1943, he was chairman from 32 to 63, and it was written just before going public. And the reason for that, if you might imagine, is if the fourth paragraph is finally to our shareholder, shareholders, well, if that's the only consideration, we might lose our way. So there was a sense that having a noble cause and purpose was something that we needed to institutionalize and make part of our leadership. So who we hire and how we coach and how we train them and reward them is based on our credo. That actually turns out to be a nifty set of constraints mm -hmm. when we're thinking about what our system is. Yeah, one so, of the nice things, um, and the credo, I've seen this, what's funny is a lot of organizations um, have what I would call the ninth waste of lean, which would be um, mission statements and value statements, right? That's mm -hmm. the ninth unstated waste and lean. Um, but the credo actually acts as something that guides and forms and provides some set of guardrails so that we could actually empower and enable the emergence of different kinds of work streams to happen, different ways of people organizing, different, different kinds yeah. of experiments that would actually go about. But before we did that, I, we, we just wanted to insert one more uh, kind of backgrounder thing. And where did this all come yeah. from when who Mark started, started his journey a couple of years ago? Or whose fault was it? <laughs> whose fault it is, right? <laughs> well, I could start um, emergently enough. Um, people were interested in the Phoenix Project. It was a great book. And it resonated with folks that kept thinking, there's got to be a better way. Why does this, why does this feel like an out-of-body experience, this IT work I'm in? Phoenix Project um, made sense to a lot of people, and a lot of the folks that were starting to think about, why can't we at J&J &J use public cloud? Why do we have to buy all these canned software packages? Why can't we write our own? Well, you know, we were coming out of an era of highly regulated and very staid, risk-averse, okay, thinking. And risk-averse, in the conventional sense, meant don't touch it. Leave it alone, and it'll be okay. That's not going to handle the disruptive elements or the opportunities that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. So what started as a simple uh, book club uh, actually resulted in me, um, I think I met Gene once at a small conference in New Jersey uh, and then talked to Kevin. and literally had Kevin come out to uh, Redwood City mm -hmm. and do a book club for our IT leaders, which I think was pretty much the start of it. And that's 
how I met you. Right, and then uh, uh, I guess he hadn't had enough abuse, so he invited Kevin and I to come back to J&J &J in, in Raritan, yes. New Jersey, where we did a thing, this is one of the, the thinking tools that comes out of Eli Goldratt's Theory of Constraints, we did a current reality tree. Um, and we tried to identify what are all the potential undesirable effects that are happening within your system that might prevent a move to flow thinking, um, that might prevent the transformation of this organization. So we didn't even necessarily say DevOps. Um, we didn't say no. necessarily agile or top-down lean implementation, but we said just what would prevent us from getting to flow um, and thinking yep. in terms of flow, because it really was about culture and mindset change. And these things are not something that you can necessarily um, product roadmap your way towards, right? Um, and so after Kevin and I did that, um, and we ended up doing a couple of them and then talking with some of the senior executives, we were able to, um, Mark was able to secure enough funding just for us to do some small experiments. Yes. Now, yep. um, I'm reminded a tiny bit of um, Greg Greyer's book, uh, Lean Transformation, and he talks about sometimes organizations when they're doing a DevOps transformation, they'll do it with like three small teams, they'll identify all the positive patterns, and then they will immediately go to scale it out across mm -hmm. the whole organization. Um, and I hadn't read the book at the time, but I was thinking along the same thing. I think he was running those experiments to see whether or not we were full of shit or not, right? <laughs> um, so he gave us some small teams and we learned a bunch. We also learned, you know, what are some of the dysfunctions? What are some of the constraints that are really preventing people from thinking differently and about the way they work? And one of the things that we, we introduced to, to, uh, Melvin. to Mark was this. Good old Melvin. You know, so what, how's this come together? DevOps, architecture, where's the architecture part? It's coming. <laughs> But we're thinking, you can see where our thinking is going. It's full system. Um, one could argue, particularly in architecture, architects are solutions negotiators, uh, not so much architects. And I think if you've ever had experience with architects who really output you know, actual work and deliver, they are negotiating for some technology assignment to some business need in collaboration with IT professionals in business. So for me, one of the biggest challenges I was given in, in coming up with a manner in which to improve the economic value of IT through architecture as one of our governing bodies was, why can't we get enterprise X? Enterprise data, enterprise CRM, enterprise ERP. We bought 260 versions of those enterprise <laughs> software packages, but that made perfect sense. You see, Conway's law says that in a sense, if you're a system that creates other systems, um, you're going to create those systems in the genetic structure and DNA of yourself. And conventionally, IT was the capital expense, capital and expense that went into building a factory and was depreciated over some time, either five years or 10 or 15. And it was always for the local P&L. And believe you me, that is very hard to change. Um, and that really is where we get to our next slide. Mm -hmm. So what one of the things, and, and, and especially for, for TOC aficionados, you know, yes, I realize that there are only three questions that Eli Goldratt uh, came up with. We kind of added a fourth, which was the why change. What, it, what is important about it? What, right. what, what problems are happening? And, and what we really identified was that, you know, a lot of people were, were from GNOs, all the way down to line employees, the people that actually create the value for the organization, yep. all the way up, they were either localizing for their goals and objectives, they were, they were optimizing for their performance evaluations, um, the team was optimizing for whatever it was that would make sure that they didn't get into trouble, right? Um, or to prevent a death march. <laughs> and if you think about that all the way up, just within an opco, and then think about an, an operating company CIO optimizing for their organization, and nobody was even thinking about how is this impacting the rest of the org, and how are we going to achieve any kind of enterprise value? Yeah. Um, and another why change, and I can talk about some of these elements because they've been put in the press. So as you can imagine, by the way, having a company like J&J &J show up at this kind of a, a tech conference, very rare. Um, the amount of approvals that I had to go through, you have no idea. <laughs> but well, well worth it, and that tells you something about the leaders in our executive committee. In fact, Alex Gorski, who three years ago I first met at a meet and greet for new leaders, said, when I asked him about tech innovation, he said, you know, we're, we're really the health part. We're going to let our partners do the tech. Now it's the other way around. Uh, if you talk with him or you see some of his analyst comments, we are a health tech company. And you're going to see a lot of activity in that regard. So one of the whys to change is um, 
how would I take care of uh, improving health outcomes, uh, reducing costs, and improving uh, access for people in developed or developing worlds? How could J&J do that differently uh, and uniquely? One might be that I could actually bundle outcomes from a surgical procedure for a knee or a hip implant with consumer-based coaching and behavioral analysis, the actual device itself, and then pharma-level clinical informatics to prove the effectiveness. That means you really need to have something that cuts across all of the operating companies. Um, so how did we get that? Yep. And what system are we in to do it? It had to be our economic environment. In fact, it had to be our credo. It couldn't just be, this will make this IT cost much less, or I will get your projects done much sooner because that's not what the company was really asking for. And that's a challenge because that really made IT step up and have to become a true business leader and partner, um, which we did. Mm -hmm. okay. Classic local versus global. So when you think enterprise, in our world, enterprise is conventionally, financially, the aggregate and roll up of all of the sales um, and transactions of the operating companies. What it's supposed to be, though, is the interaction of the parts as a system in novel and new means. And in doing that, we have to do things differently. Building things the same way no longer fit the mold, but it was a very hard thing to go out on a campaign and tell people and ask for that participation. We had to do something better. So back to architecture. We created a model that we call federated enterprise architecture. What that basically means is rather than have a group of people that either pursue or block IT work or hold the standards or do the metrics, we would deputize IT and business leaders in position so that they could be our sensing agents and they could also affect change before an IT initiative came to a shared service to be built. Hmm. So it had the right enterprise plugs and ports considered. And in doing that, we had to run through, and this is where Will and Praxis uh, really helped, we had to build a set of courses that was about a week, maybe four and a half days, theory of constraints and all of the related elements, cost of delay. We built a white paper that we gave to our IT leaders, uh, to our CIO, Stuart McGuigan. By the way, that white paper came back with comments written throughout the entirety of it. Um, and architecture, enterprise architecture for J&J &J became essentially a focused set of training, almost in a boot camp, where we changed people who were in an architectural role to now think about the system they're in and get armed with a community and also continued coaching so that we can do things like cost of delay and actually have people understand it. But that still doesn't solve the problem. Yeah, and there was a couple of things that we noticed along the way um, as we Two? as we were training. Yeah, oh, as we were training <laughs> these people is one. While we saw a huge amount of value at the team tactical level, um, implementing Kanban boards so that we could limit whip and improve the flow of value. The other thing is that a lot of the enterprise architects that we had deputized and sent out, they don't actually contribute to the production of any particular IT system. Right. What the flow in their systems is actually decisions. Um, and usually it was bad decisions. And, and one of the things we use, and it's kind That's of a joke. Local decisions. Right, local decisions. <laughs> and one of the things that we used to train them was simple things like if anybody's seen the Lucille Ball chocolate video yes. of the factory yeah. and just teaching people to understand that if you don't see what is coming from upstream and if you don't understand or have empathy for the people downstream, it's very difficult for you to understand the why of what you're actually doing. And so we thought about, okay, we want to we want to have a period of time where people are actually putting all the decisions into a Kanban or a personal Kanban, tracking the flow of those decisions and just tagging them. Is this more value creation? So is this value demand or is this failure demand? And if it's yep. failure demand, how do we root cause that so that we get more more decisions flowing through the and system. The biggest root cause that resonated across all of them um, was Mr. Conway again. Or at least uh, our version of him. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but applied to something that we all hold dear and we never challenged, which was projects. Projects in our world were, uh, considering the system had to be enterprise, the project was actually a subscale constraint laterally for different silos of data and function, and temporally, 
because you had to do everything within a year, or within a year, uh, we relaxed those. And we didn't relax it for every single thing that we've got in the shop. That would be nearly impossible. We have to cover some ground. We relaxed it for data. And that's currently what we're doing. So enterprise architecture applied at Johnson & Johnson is not so much the practice of it, but it's the meaningful creation of value along Goldratt's theory of constraints. Subordinate all else and move on. Which gave us at least the cover, and this is where we're moving to, is this notion of embedding this continuous improvement all the way down at the team level, but then all the way up at the OPCO and then the senior executive level. And we say, for a flow of IT capabilities that deliver economic value. So we have our standard um, explore, optimize, create a new position. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things that we did was we said, okay, for all of these enterprise architects, if you're gonna be sensing business intent and getting ahead of that so that bad things don't end up at the doorstep of procurement, and all of a sudden you have um, a capital expense re request, um, we need to teach them how to talk to people and talk to the business, and we're gonna need yes. to figure out what is our current standard work, um, and then teach them the basic double diamond of design thinking. So you can see that it's kind of a mix match, and, and, and with a heavy toolbox, of course, you gotta lug it around, but it, provide the coaching as well so that people would know if I really need to understand what is the business intent I need to know who is the customer well that means these people need to actually yep. learn the skills of talking to human beings and the nice thing at least um, Mark was able to get us a meeting with the global CIO and he said yeah. normally yeah. IT thinks about their customer as the business unit IT or the business itself I want you and I'm giving you the sponsorship and the freedom to say the patient itself is the customer so our IT leader gave us that permission, and I'll wrap up because I know I'm over. This is hard to put in 25 minutes though. So technology is a benefit if it diminishes a limitation. Our limitation is considered the larger economic good. In fact, what's getting in the way of J&J &J and its noble cause? And here's proof of life that this model is working. Um, this was one of the first deliverables that was under it, which is our software defined and hybrid cloud environment that literally used some of these toolkits and gave us reason and hope for there's gonna be a lot more. So finally, so to conclude, these are um, some of the principles at least that we've discovered. These are gonna change. Yeah. Some of them are riffing on other principles like lean principles, but visualize your work, but first visualize the system. And one thing we did was had people value stream their work then fit that into the value stream of their upstream and downstream customers and keep going up two levels so that people understand the relationship of the value they're creating to the larger systems and the subsystems within larger systems. And then the other thing was really, what are the biggest constraints and do one at a time? Do not create a massive backlog yep. of constraints that you have to design countermeasures for. Pick the biggest one. It might be your capital expense request. It might be the project funding. It, whatever it is, identify that one thing Focus on that, design the countermeasure, yeah. move on. And go end to end as opposed to broad. Mm -hmm. uh, the IT industry experts are, we're great at starting. We have to start stopping. Yeah, and then uh, we have a few more challenges. Yeah. Luckily, the project office reports to Mark. But the, the thing that we're tackling now is the, the idea that normally projects come in, resources are identified, resources are assigned to projects. If we're moving from resource efficiency to flow efficiency, we have to turn that entire model yep. around, which means that we're gonna be pretty busy for the next year negotiating, identifying constraints, running experiments to find if it's possible to create a pull model so that people aren't being assigned to projects, but projects are being pulled by cross-functional yes. dedicated teams. We're doing this at small scale now, and we're gonna to continue to spin this up. Uh, one last thing that we wanted to share with you, We've documented every, all of our references, everything that inspired us for this talk. It's all up on SlideShare. Um, it's gonna be available in the app, so you can get it. We're, avail we're here for the entire conference, so yep. questions, small tactical or really big strategy, Hoshin Conry kind of questions, we're available to talk. We love exploring and, and, and just kind of riffing on yeah, these things. And learning too. So please, yeah. walk up to us, talk to us about it. It's, it. We've had a great journey. Thank you. Yes, thank you.